because everyone knows, but he is where everyone wants to be in just a few years. And further along, getting VC funding, getting that validation that your idea is working and that your idea has legs and that your idea has support. So I'm not gonna say much more. Please help me welcome Brian. All right, so thank you for the introduction. I don't think I'm nearly half of what he said, well-renowned, all that other things. So yeah, I guess um, just as a bit of a background, as, um, as he mentioned, I am currently working with a startup. We call ourselves Chemisense. And um, we're an early stage startup, which means that we founded like relatively recently. We're still raising a seed round of funding. Um, the seed round that we're currently raising is in the range of 1.2 million, as mentioned. We're still in the process of raising that. We have several investors already signed on, Money in the Bank, a couple others committed, and then a couple others uh, lead investors that are in the process of technical due diligence. So I'll give you, what I'll probably do today is go over a brief overview of the company, and then I'll kind of go on into the challenges, I guess the theme of the course, which is like the, tech, the challenges, how you overcome them, and how you deal with them. So I guess um, I'll just go through the pitch. This is kind of the standard pitch we give to investors. This is, I guess, an example of how we can give you guys like what uh, entrepreneurs pitch to investors, a successful one, I should say, is kind of like. So uh, I guess I'll get started with that. So um, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Brian again, and um, I'm one of the founders and current CEO of Chemisense. And we're a team of chemical engineers, uh, computer scientists, and physicists from UC Berkeley, Caltech, and Princeton. And we're here to bring you the world's first wearable air quality monitor for the consumer market. Now, some of you may be asking at this point, why be concerned about air quality? And the answer is that air quality is a huge and growing problem across the world today. You see lung cancer, respiratory illnesses, cardiopulmonary illnesses. These are all significant problems, health problems, directly related to poor air quality. And all in all, 3.3 million deaths around the world each year is caused by poor air. This doesn't even take into account kind of the chronic diseases. These are the diseases like asthma, lung cancer, emphysema, and bronchitis. These are the respiratory illnesses that will not kill you in the relatively short amount of time, but this will significantly and adversely affect the quality of your life on a day-to-day -day basis. And in the United States alone, this is a huge market today. $56 billion is spent on treating or combating the worst effects of asthma alone. You see another 10 for lung cancer, another 49 for emphysema and bronchitis. This doesn't even begin to cover the $1 billion, and this is a rapidly growing market covered by activists. These are just the people who are willing to spend money on environmental sensing, the people who want to know what is in the environment around them today and what's going on with their daily lives and health. So the huge market is available and untapped at the current time. So if you look at the current way air quality is done in the United States, and for that matter, generally across the world today, it is done by very large, expensive machinery, maybe like 21 in the entire greater LA area alone. So these are kind of, the point is that these are huge machines, extremely accurate, but extremely expensive, not portable, and above all, they don't give you actionable data. For example, um, since I'm from LA, I'll give you an example. I live in Northridge, and there is one EPA monitoring station in my city, but the EPA monitoring station is going to get me the air quality data all the way, like, say, 10 miles from where my house is. And air quality varies quite a bit. So at my house, the air quality could be basically a red, whereas in the EPA area, they can say it's a green. And this is not actionable data. And as a result, if you have something like asthma, you have something like COPD, you need hyper-local data, not just the data that we can get from these EPA sites. And that's why, we br that's why we're bringing our solution to the market, which is a low-cost portable chemical sensor, which can detect air quality in a hyper-local manner. On top of this, by putting this into a wearable device, you can actually do indoor air quality, which is currently impossible, and you can do uh, basically heat maps. So you can generate, by crowdsourcing the data from each of our users, you can kind of get a heat map of where, um, where our users are and what the air quality in those areas are, giving you a much more detailed map than you're currently able to get right now. So this is just kind of a brief competitive analysis. You can see that we have significant advantages over the municipal status quo, indoor coverage, accuracy, pri well, I guess not accuracy, indoor, ac indoor coverage, price, alerts, and size. So this is just kind of a list of the chemicals we have. This is, I guess, uh, at its core, a hardware startup and a technology-based startup, which is quite a bit significantly different from kind of the, the software startups that you hear so much about in the Valley these days. Although hardware startups is becoming a thing, I'll talk about that in a bit more in the challenges section after the pitch. 
Um, what we do is we use a technology called chemi resistors. This is basically, to go a bit into the science, I'll touch briefly on it. It's basically a polymer uh, that's functionalized to detect certain class of compounds, in this case, just the blue ones. You put it into a circuit, you can detect the changes in resistance, and you basically can get a characteristic reaction curve off of that. And you can kind of use that to get a fingerprint of the chemical and determine what's in the air around you. This is just some of the data we have for ethanol, ethanol repeatability, toluene. Um, kind of the go-to market is that you, the key here is that you have to find a very large and attractive market, so to say. And one of the most attractive ones is children who are in the learning phases of the disease asthma. And this is uh, kind of two big reasons is that First, it would be the parents that are willing to pay for the children's device. As you know, parents who see their children in trouble are perhaps one of the, like, to be perfectly blunt, it, they're, they're, they're amongst the most willing to shell out money to have to protect the health of their children. So it's a huge market, a perfect, a, a very large market in and of itself. And this doesn't even take into account the overall asthma market, which is over 25 million in the United States alone, leading to a multi-billion market there. On top of that, low-cost chemical sensing can be used in a huge wide range of industries ranging from mining, defense, oil and gas, agriculture. The opportunities there are huge, and that's kind of why we're interested in doing low-cost chemical sensing in the first place. So this is just kind of a brief, in, uh, brief overview of like some of the, the people we already signed letter of intents with, a lot of traction coming in from there, and then also this our team. Uh, these are the four founding members of the team. Again, uh, my, the CEO, Will, Gina, and Michael are my co-founders. Um, we met here at Berkeley, and then we founded the team together. Um, we've come a long way since then. And uh, we also managed to kind of get a, one of the, the most important things is to get a very strong advisory board. We have one of the global directors at Honeywell um, as an advisor. Honeywell is one of the largest chemical sensors, uh, sensing companies in the world today. Uh, Naeem Zafar, current VP at Oracle, a uh, serial entrepreneur, and we also have Paul Lum, who's a manager at the BNC here at Berkeley as a technical advisor. So that's kind of the pitch that I give, and this is kind of the key points here is that I guess you have to point out the market, you have to point out that it's a huge market, you don't want to be talking about, I guess the old phrase goes, you don't want to be talking about like tens of millions. If you have a market size in the tens of millions, in general, you're not going to get that much of interest. You're going to have to come up with a use case that is in the multi-billions and that's when people, at least in the total of available market. So you're at least going to need some form of that, and you have to identify a space that is attractive enough for the people that you're talking to. For example, like this is one of the challenges that we faced early in the start of, in, in, early in the company, I should say. So we got our team together, and we came up with the idea, hey, low-cost chemical sensing. This is a great idea. There's a lot of markets, as I kind of pointed out here. There's a huge, huge range of markets here. Like oil and gas is basically the holy grail of all like chemical engineers. You hear anything about a chemical engineer who's like who's made it big or the biggest market in chemical engineering, it's generally people like Exxon, it's generally people like Chevron. That is kind of where the biggest market is, and that's where we kind of first looked at our first customers. Like, hey, maybe if we can get if we can perfect this technology, then why don't we turn to oil and gas? But the issue is like when you're kind of coming in as a first time entrepreneur, like obviously what, I'm not that many years older than you, I don't have that many years of experience in industry, you're going to see, you're going to see like experience problems. You're gonna say, hey, you're a first timer, why should we trust you guys over say, again, Honeywell, which we've been working with for like 10, 20, 30 years. You're going to see kind of an incumbency problem. You're going to see a problem that you're a first timer in the market you're probably inexperienced, and they're going to they're going to look at that as a negative, especially if you're in kind of a tech field. So you have to kind of like kind of one of our first challenges was to find the market that is that doesn't really have a good solution right now, and it, that's how we came up onto the air quality monitoring solutions. People need the device, especially if you have something like asthma, something like COPD. You need a device that can tell you this, but there is no solution, and the that's the barrier of entry is a lot lower. You don't have to compete with the giants like Honeywell. You, don't, you, also, you just have to make sure that your device works, of course, number one thing. And number two is that you can, get, uh, you can get an effective market reach out. And there's a huge difference between kind of like, that's kind of like the first challenge. We had to find a market that is attractive and we could enter. Kind of a, a related challenge to that is that um, if you look at people like in the consumer space, like which is kind of what we're attacking right now, it's a very different set of requirements than, uh, I guess in some cases there are some related requirements, but in a lot of cases, the set of requirements is quite different from like business versus consumer. Like with a consumer device, the phrase goes like, anyone can screw up a consumer device very, very easily. Like you'd be surprised at all the things that they do 
like over the course of like having, let's say just like having a smartphone, you drop it, you throw water on it, you throw all sorts of things bad onto your smartphone, it has to be able to work even under all those conditions. Whereas if you have like a single stationary sensor in a, um, say in a factory, in general, you're not gonna get a worker kind of going up and accidentally spilling water on it. So it's a very different set of, um, I guess, requirements there. On top of that, you're going to have to look at a fact that if you're a consumer, you're not gonna wear something that looks horrible. Obviously, you're not gonna wear something that's going to brand you as like, oh, you have this gigantic clunky device on your wrist, that's not gonna look good, no one's gonna buy that. So you have a different set of challenges and kind of you have to identify that set of challenges before going into an investor meeting and that's kind of one of the things that they will always ask you, like why consumer? Do you know the challenges of the consumer market? Do you know the challenges of the business market? Why are you doing this? And this is one of the challenges that, that challenges, so to say, that you will be facing if you decide to go into the entrepreneurship route. And it, a lot of this is that you just have to sit down, do the market research. You have to do, you have to be able to throw in a lot of hard work into the market research. And on top of that, like myself, I'm an engineer, so you, you're going to have to learn things that you weren't exactly completely familiar with in the first place. Caltech is probably one of the least startup friendly areas of, in terms of colleges. <laughs> it's very much you go in, get a PhD, do research, try to get a Nobel Prize, and so the phrase goes at Caltech. When you're in Caltech, someone that you're in, that someone in the school that you're with will get a Nobel Prize if the trend has continued <laughs> the last couple of years. That's kind of the way Caltech runs. So coming to Berkeley, you're going, like myself, I faced a huge, I guess, change in terms of culture. Like here, as you know, like it's all about startups, all about entrepreneurship. You bring things out into the valley, you get all sorts of things like that. So you have to, like part of my challenge is that you quickly have to be able to sit down, spend time, learn things about marketing, learn things a bit about business, learn things that you weren't exactly exposed to. Myself, I'm a mechanical engineer, as I mentioned, that you weren't really exposed to back in undergrad or back in whatever training you had. If you're like working with a tech startup and let's say you're originally an econo economics major, you're gonna need to learn some phrasing on say the tech side. You're gonna need to know like what an API is, how the languages work, what like how to basically sell the company. And obviously if you don't know anything about the tech, you're going to need to learn about it. And that's kind of the same way for some, like for some of the members of our company, they came in with more of an economic background and then they have to be able to sell the company. So they have to pick up aspects of the technology, kind of get the answers, how the basic core technology that we're using works. And that's one of, the, one of the big challenges in our group as well. You have to be able to learn things that are outside your comfort zone. And a lot of that is just, you're gonna to have to sit down and throw in some time and effort. Um, I guess the last one, um, I think I've been talking for like a good 20 minutes. So I think the last one I can kind of touch on is that of fundraising, which as I mentioned, we're still in the, fra in, we're still in the fundraising phase. So as a hardware startup, as a technology startup, kind of you're going to run into a different set of problems than say, um, people who have, who, people who are working with, um, say, software. Like, there's a different set of requirements in hardware and software, and one of the big things is that you're going to have to learn how to sell yourself as, uh, like, how to sell yourself on the differences and how to explain the difference as well. Like, for a large amount of time, obviously, software startups were the thing. Like, everyone was investing in them. Everyone was getting rich quick. That's kind of the dot-com boom and all those things. Because the idea is that with a, with a software startup, you need three guys, a computer, some money and lo and behold you can get a product out that's instantaneously scalable and instantaneously like if people anything web related became a pretty big hit pretty quickly back in the day so there are like still today in the valley i can still pretty strongly say that there is a significant lean towards technology or like i guess i should say software startups things that you don't really need a base technology that used to be the case in, like back in the old days kind of the way silicon valley got its name was by semiconductor startups and that's kind of the way that it originally started. And back then there was the very good understanding that, look, you're going to invest in the company, it's gonna take like five to six years to come up with a product, commercialize it, throw it out on the market. And given that mindset, it's very easy to get a, uh, a hardware startup invested in back in the old days. Now there's the, there's the feeling that, oh, two guys with a computer can, get, can, can come up with something. It might not be the biggest long-term thing, but it's a, lot, it's a nice little short-term thing that throw money in, get a quick return, exit. <laughs> what you're doing is like a hardware startup. Like in the recent times, things have started coming up, like obviously you got Fitbit, Jawbone, Fuel Vans, Nest, things like that. So you kind of have, like the market has changed a bit. People now are interested again in hardware because basically software, if you look at the people that are doing software, it's basically a rehash of, of something that's been done before. Like I've seen like a rooting app, like one of the, um, 
I guess not to bash on an idea that I heard, but this is a funded idea that was basically a routing app just for plumbers. It was basically Google Maps for plumbers, and it was a funded idea. And that's kind of how like the mindset of people, you kind of have to attack the mindset like, look, this may take a bit more time, but then the market is huge, the potential benefits are huge, and you, you have to be able to explain why they should invest in, say, a more long-term thing, prove that you are the right team versus I can toss a couple couple hundred thousand at these guys who are making this thing that has been tried and true with small margins and a good chance of, and then hopefully they can get that done. So that's another problem. And a big way that you kind of do that is like point out, like you have to show that you know what you're doing, you have a long-term plan. And this is something that again, you have to sit down, think about with your team and things like that. So that's kind of the um, challenges, I should say that we've been facing, we have faced, we are still facing with the startup and beyond that, I can probably take any questions since apparently 20 minutes is the time I have to speak. Well. Sure. How did you choose and select your advisory board? So I guess like one of the things, um, if I go to the advisory board, is that you have to think of what is your field, basically. And what's, what is your current goals? What are your future goals? And what do you need? in the mid to long term future. So there's like kind of two ways I can talk about this. There's the pure advisory board and there's also kind of the investors that the investors that you choose. So obviously like if you're in a very desperate stage, you don't have the luxury of choosing an investor, but if you get to a point in time that you have money in the bank, you're not going you're not on the verge of bankruptcy all the time, which a lot of startups honestly are, you can actually kind of choose like what ex what field of expertise do your investors have? Like for example, with chemical detection, you're going to want someone, like you can see someone say who invests, who knows all about software. He might be a famous guy in the Valley, but he invested only in software startups. And maybe he wants to do for the first time a hardware startup. Then you kind of have to weigh the benefit of, this guy's a famous guy, but he has no experience in what we're doing. Is there an advantage in getting the name value versus what we need now? So this is kind of like a constant question. And this is kind of what I can kind of touch on at the advisory board itself. As I mentioned, Prabhu is a member of Honeywell, and Honeywell is basically the, so to say, 500 pound gorilla in terms of the chemical sensing space currently. So he knows what the markets are, he knows the science behind the technology, he knows the contacts, he knows the people like that. So obviously, one of the reasons why I want Prabhu is he's in basically the same space, but he's willing to help us out as a fellow, as a, he also was a former entrepreneur, so he knows what it is to go through the startup space. So obviously, he was a very good choice to have. He's in the same space. He knows what we're doing right now. He knows what's going to be coming up in the future. He knows kind of what the challenges are coming up as a hardware startup in the Valley. So that's why like we choose someone like him, like he's an obvious choice. But for example, with like Naeem Zafar, you might think, hey, he's Oracle. This is kind of like a telecommunications company. Why is he on your advisory board, right? So obviously we're a hardware startup or things like that. We're a chemicals startup. But one of the things that you can kind of see in, in terms of that is in the future vision, what do you want to do with just a chemical sensor, right? If you can, like I can go, we can basically go and say, we're going to have a chemical sensor and be an OEM manufacturer, just sell chips, nothing else but the chips. But if you kind of look at that business model in general, it, it has much lower margins than say, if you actually create a system that you can sell to people. And kind of the idea is that we have a network of chemical sensors. Our idea is that we can actually sell entire integrated system to given plants. You can have a way to interconnect all of the all of our sensors, get the data to our users in a very good form. And to do that, we would need expertise beyond the chemical engineering and the business side of people we have. And that's kind of where a person like Naeem Zafar would step in. He knows, he's been an entrepreneur himself, that's one advantage, but also he has the network, he has the experience in networks. He can work with us to kind of, to kind of put together an integrated solution to sell to people rather than just, hey, we have a single sensor chip, you want the sensor chip. And you can get a lot, that's kind of like a future direction of the company. And finally, with like people like Paul Lum, um, he's, an ex he's been through the startup space again. It's very important, I, in my opinion, to have someone who knows the <laughs> because they're quite different from the big company. But the key thing here is that he knows as far as what we need for the current technical development. Because obviously, as an early stage startup, we're still in the middle of technical development. He has the knowledge, the expertise to kind of help us along at the, at the current time. He's a purely current guy that he can help us as far as um, what we're developing 
how we're developing and all the things like that. So the important thing is to know what you need right now and what you're going to need in the future. If the person fits both of those criteria, then the question becomes that of name value. If you already have someone who's perhaps like less famous or more famous, you can kind of answer the question then. But as it is right now uh, for our startup, this is kind of the way we, had, we kind of gather together our advisory board. I think you're the next question, yeah. Um, I'm curious, uh, do you have technical barrier? I mean, um, I'm not a chemistry student, sure. so I'm, I'm wondering whether this technique, uh, the technology in this uh, wearing waistband is, you know, is there any possibility that another company, for, for example, Honeywell, and mm -hmm. do the same thing as you, you guys? So that's one of the risks you're always going to have to take. Like, obviously, Google can at any time enter a market because they have a, to use an expert, their shit ton of money here. <laughs> oh, I know horrible word there, but they have, like Google, for example, like let's say you're in a hardware startup and you wanted to make, like five years ago, you wanted to make a self-driving car. Wonderful idea, but out of the blue, Google comes in and they're obviously going to have like a billion dollars in spare cash, and you're going to have a couple million of seed money capital. That's a risk you have to take, and this is kind of why you call it venture capital. It's, you're going to take a bet, and you're going to have to say, I think I can make a self-driving car. I think I can do it well, and I think we're the right team to do it. But there's always the risk that someone else who has more resources, more money, more time, more expertise can come in and compete with you and ultimately knock you out. And kind of one of the interesting things that I've seen in the Silicon Valley, and this is something I guess you can talk about in terms of culture, but let's say you go to a market that's like less used to, um, like less used to entrepreneurship. Let's say you go to China, let's say you go to Japan, like there aren't like I guess they're known for like the big corporations. They do excellent work there, but they're not quite as well known for entrepreneurship on a large scale. For example, like I'll throw that out there, take it as you will. And part of the reason why, like if you if you look at like one of the common reasons explanations why this is so is that the margin for failure there is a lot lower. Like if you say the way that the Silicon Valley currently runs is they say ninety percent of the startups fail. Like you try to you found the company, say I have a startup. Nine times out of 10, it'll fail. Like probably where we're at right now, we still have a good 60% chance of failure. Like we got some money, we still have the tech, we still have a huge chance of failure. It's a matter we have to overcome those barriers. But if you look at a company, if you look at a country such as China, you look at Chile even, like you'll see that if you make one bad investment, it kind of is a black mark, you lose face. The, the margin of failure, like if you say, I failed on this investment, you're going to actually lose face there. And that kind of prevents people from being as entrepreneurship as take, reduces the kind of risk taking. So one of the big things is here, you have to be open to the chance that, hey, my first startup might fail. Good chance, 60% chance that I'll still fail. We got, we de-risked the company by about 30%, still 60% chance of failure. So it's one of those things that you have to be willing to take the risk and see it out to either the glorious victory or the, or the bitter end. It's going to be one of those things. So take, that's kind of the way that I can answer it. So, uh what is your strategy when, when it comes to compete with other mm -hmm. big companies? I, to a degree, there's nothing you can do if a big company wants to come in. So what you kind of have to do is, in one sense, you kind of have to hope that like the 60-foot gorilla, does, like the 600-pound gorilla does not directly want to compete. But obviously, chemical sensing has been around for a while, right? Like it's been around since the dawn of chemistry. But the way that, we're, that we originally dealt with it is that we look, you have to sit down and do the ground. Like what technologies are out there? What are the drawbacks of the current technologies that are out there? And what technologies can be used to attack the spaces that really do not have a good solution right now? So like the, to kind of touch a bit on how we came across, like how we came across using chemi-resistors as our primary technologies, that look, if you look at like chemical sensors in the mines today, they, I think they're a combination of something called photoionization detectors and um, also infrared, like uh, kind of optical sensors. The big drawbacks here is that they're big devices. They're about this large, and they take about like $1,000 to $2,000 to build. On top of that, they have to be changed.